hear stories all the time from folks who have found something or somebody who came through on Route 66 in the 30s or somebody that came to the factory and John Frank met them, visited with them and gave them a piece of pottery and just gave it to them. He was, he was known for doing that. He was a very generous person. So I think that goes back to kind of connecting with people. It's, it, it's not an impersonal type pottery. I think Frank Homa has an appeal for everybody. It appeals to the common person, I think. And when you know that it's all done by hand, and when you see the production, and you see all of these different people and all the steps that go through to get to the final piece, there's a little bit of everybody in a piece of Frank Homa. It was made with love. Employees all put themselves in the clay, and each piece holds that caring, loving vibration of each individual it touches. Originally born from clay dug just outside Ada, Oklahoma, Francoma is one of the most recognizable and desirable potteries in the world. From rare and valuable artware to the collectible figurines to the more common dinnerware, Francoma has carved out its own niche among distinctly American ceramic art forms. Francoma pottery is collectible uh, because it, of its just uniqueness and it's also, you know, it, it draws a lot of local interest. Uh, uh, being a, a, one of Oklahoma's only uh, pottery companies that, had, that continued for as long. It is distinctive and unique in that, you know, when you do walk into like an antique store or a collectible show, it pops right out. There was really nothing like it, at, you know, even since it started or up until now. I don't think there's anything that you would say was a knockoff of Frank Homa. It's, it's just very, very individual, and I think that it's, you know, it's just distinctive. John Frank, a native of Chicago, moved to Norman, Oklahoma in 1927 to start the ceramics program at OU. Within just a few years, the desire to open his own pottery business led him to create Frank Potteries, and the name soon morphed into Frank Oma Pottery in homage to his adopted home state. Armed with a great personality, astounding talent, and a relentless drive, John Frank's beautiful and unique creations quickly found admirers and supporters. He really lived for the day, but yet he always looked to the future. You, you had to, in a product that's going to sell, you had to look for something new all the time or the, the people are not going to buy it. Anybody that came up and needed a dollar, he would give it to them. He never had money. My mother, if it weren't for my mother, we wouldn't be, we'd be living on the street in cardboard box right now. He just always thought the Lord would provide and he would give. He loved people, absolutely loved people, and uh, was quite a happy person, a jokester of sorts. After John Frank settled in Norman, he used his connection with university geologists to track down the perfect clay for his artwork. He examined several deposits before striking gold, so to speak, just outside of Ada. There he discovered a vein of golden colored clay with the consistency and composition for which he had been searching. He knew he could build a business out of this clay. For the next 20 years, he would make many trips between Norman and Ada to harvest the rich vein. The uh, Ada clay was found in, uh, in the 20s and then he took it back to OU and, and used it in, the, in the, his studies there. Uh, and then that's got him the idea to start making uh, and, and opening up his own commercial pottery company. And if it wasn't for the Ada clay deposit, the Frank Oma may have never been. John Frank used Ada clay before there was a Frank Oma pottery. He found the vein of clay in Ada that fired the golden yellow, which was very unique. It was a high quality clay. 
And when he was uh, uh, in the art department uh, at OU in the 20s, uh, used Ada Clay. It was dug here in Ada, uh, trucked on a flatbed truck to Norman, and uh, then he you know, did everything by hand. And then when they moved to 38 to Sepulpa, he still continued to use Ada Clay. It was such a high quality clay. Whoever they could find that would in fact go and camp out on site in Ada and dig clay. Wasn't anything glamorous about it, just pure old labor. And so they'd take off on Monday, come back on Friday, maybe on Thursday, until they got the truck full. Look of raggy, dirty, you know, there's just four guys out there sleeping on the ground. The Ada clay deposit was found to be the best clay in Oklahoma. It was being uh, used by a company called the Ada Pottery Company who was not in continuous production. They just made mostly crocs, stoneware type crocs. They would make a few, then they'd quit business for a while until they got them sold, and then they would come back and make some more. But the Ada clay was, a deposit was a, kind of like a communal deposit for, for people. Like the Ada Brick Company made, uh, bought, got their clay from it, and uh, other sources uh, used that clay deposit because it was such a good clay deposit, uh, better than anything else in Oklahoma. Equally important to John Frank's craft were the colorful glazes he designed and mixed himself. With a light-colored Ada clay, he had found the perfect canvas to display his colors. The interaction of the clay and the glaze was very important to him. The better the two got along, the better the final piece would be. John Frank liked the clay because it was uh, so versatile. He also uh, had mentioned that it was the only clay he had ever found that uh, you could fire once, meaning you would bring it out of the, the cast, trim it, glaze it before it was uh, bisque fired, and just fire it once. The retail glazes that John Frank designed are very unique, and the minute you see them, you know instantly that it's Frank Homa. Even though a lot of people have tried to copy those, they're not the same. The Ada clay uh, was one of the lighter firing clays, and in pottery, a lot of times you want the lighter firing clays to give you a better uh, color for your glazes. It also fired hotter so they could go all the way up to like a, a little uh, almost 2,000 degrees. It, it was just bordering um, stoneware clay. I know that that was a problem with some of the other companies. Um, the, the lower the temperature the less well the clay holds up. It's more easy to chip it when you're washing it. If the other stuff was a higher temperature clay or a more dense clay, then it would hold up more. John Frank mined Ada clay for about 25 years, creating some of his most sought after pieces during that period. In the mid 1950s, he located another attractive clay deposit in Sepulpa, Oklahoma. But the difference between the clays would be as distinct as night and day. The Ada clay deposit had been generous and had served to build the company's early name and reputation. The end of the golden colored clay deposit, some would say, would also mark the end of Frank Oma's golden era, although Frank Oma pottery had yet to reach its zenith in terms of popularity. The real reason that we left Ada, clay is a vein, just like oil is a vein, or gas is a vein in the earth when God made shale and he made this, and he made, you've seen a lot of posters with all these levels. So this surfaced in Ada, and we got all that we had leased to get. There was more clay there, good clay, but the lady didn't want to sell it, her property to us to, for us to dig a hole in the earth, so we couldn't get it. From 1955 on, all new Frank Oma pieces, both artware and dinnerware, would be created out of the Sepulpa deposit, a reddish clay very different from the golden Ada clay. The switchover still serves as a very clear line of demarcation in Frank Oma's history for collectors. 
Some prefer the Ada pieces, while others go for the Sepulpa pieces. The two periods certainly became distinct. Now, clay has a personality. The Ada clay, which was so important to the beginning of Frank Oma, had its personality. And the clay here in Sepulpa, when we moved our clay um, mining or strip mining uh, here to Sepulpa, the personality of the red firing clay or red earth firing clay is also different. The Ada clay was um, more calm and its approach to the design and to the person that held it. The colors really, whether it was a royal blue or a, a you know an early yellow or a, jade green or jade, some of those early, early colors, ivory, showed the true colors. It didn't really show, it wasn't as modeled or as streaked. It was a, it was a truer color and it just totally changed. Not that it was a bad thing, but when it changed to sepulpa clay, you ended up uh, with a different rutile glaze, different treatment on it, and you saw a lot more two-tone. So if you look at the earlier pieces, there's a truer color that's a solid color, whether it's a blue, a green, a yellow, uh, a brown, uh, the, there's truer colors. You see the glaze more. The clay is more of a backdrop, and when they went to the red clay, the red clay interacted and, and made a whole different presentation of what the glaze looks like. On a red clay, the glazes will be less bright than say on a white clay because you don't have the color bleeding through the glaze but he may have gone back and adapted the glazes some too and you know worked with them to get them to where he wanted them but um, mostly it has to do with how vitreous the clay is when it's fired which is glassy later pieces were more earthenware the red ones which is a lower temperature the original Ada ones were a higher temperature and more dense. They probably held up better than the later ones that were the red clay, which is more porous and not fired as high, so it's less vitreous and it's easier to chip. And that's one of the things that collectors are always looking. You know, you don't buy anything that's got a chip or a ding on it. The major difference is, is the color, and I, other than uh, possibly the firing temperature, the early uh, Ada clay could be fired hotter. If you put a little bit of water on the bottom of it uh, and it doesn't change color, then it's Ada clay. Whereas the clay that they eventually turn to, uh, which was, is a, a shell red firing clay, if you put a little water on that, it, it will change color. It will get darker because it's absorbing some of the water. Uh, the Ada clay would vitrify or, or fuse together better in the, f in the firing process, which made it a better clay. Differences in clay aside, the timing of Frank Oma's move to Sepulpa couldn't have been better. World War II made a tremendous impact on the entire country. The new factory would be located along Route 66, which was reaching its apex in terms of traffic volume in the 1950s and 1960s. This period brought John Frank's company its highest level of exposure and truly helped plant his brand and products deep in the American consciousness. When John Frank started, it was all art pottery. As they got into World War II um, and the economy was very restricted because of war rationing and all that, they went to more utilitarian pieces. That's also one of the best times basically for some of the, the curios and the small miniature pieces because during World War II, uh, nothing could be imported from Japan or overseas. Everything had to be from the United States. So a lot of companies um, made curios for the curio market and Frank Homa did that. And of course, being on Route 66, folks you know, from all over the United States as they traveled Route 66 came through and bought things like that and took as souvenirs, whether it's salt and peppers or little animal figurines or little miniature pitchers or vases. Not everybody collected artware. Not everybody collected vases and things like that. And not everybody was into curios. So uh, 
John Frank was pretty savvy and looked at the market of what what does the everyday family use and how can I you know, be a part of that. And right up until the time they closed, they made a tremendous amount of dinnerware and basically that, be, that ended up being most of what they did. They still made artware along and figurines and statues and things like that uh, all the way through their existence, but they basically uh, kind of transformed themselves into something where they could uh, survive. John Frank's ingenious move into America's kitchens and dining rooms via Francoma dinnerware helped elevate his business to new heights and also brought a renewed interest in his earlier artware, which was becoming more and more collectible and valuable with time. He reached a professional pinnacle in 1971 when he was named Outstanding Small Businessman in America, which led to a congratulatory summit within President Richard Nixon. Two years later, John Frank passed away. Before his death, his daughter John East, who had been active at Francoma since she was a child, took over his responsibilities at the company. When John East was running the company in the 70s when I started, because her father had passed away, family was a big thing for her. And um, the employees at Francoma were always given priority when it came to hiring family members. And she would have Christmas dinners, uh, we would have get-togethers. If there was anything wrong, Johnny's always knew about it. She knew everybody's name. Uh, she knew their families. It, it was a family operation. There is no question that John Frank would be pleased to see how valuable and collectible his creations have become some 40 years later. He'd be even more pleased to see how much people love and treasure those creations. Those who collect sometimes have a hard time explaining why. They're too busy looking for that next piece. When we moved to uh, Tulsa, my dad was transferred to the cement plant there and we went to the Francoma factory in about 1960. And uh, we would go, they had a seconds room, and we would go and my mom would buy seconds. And that's where we got all our dishes was uh, from, the, from the factory. You could go over there in Sepulpa on Route 66, which was really just about you know, 15 miles from our house, and we would go, and we'd get to buy a few things. Of course, at that time, a lot of the stuff was 15 cents, 30 cents, a dollar. So I, I remember going when I was young, being able to go through there and pick out some things, and, and uh, you know, I've still got a few of those little things. I started collecting uh, when I was about 13 or 14 and, and our Sunday school teacher gave us a, a GOP mug for Christmas one year and I was a already a collector of, of sorts. I collected stamps and coins and, and that would just kind of, you know, did it for me. Once he gave me that mug then I started uh, having to search out for more. So I've been collecting and I, and I live really close, you know, I live within 10 miles of the plant. So, um, so it just kind of became a natural for me to want to start collecting. One of the first things I saw was a, a pair of little Indian masks, a brave and a maiden Indian masks. And uh, I got to pick those out and I got to, got to take those home and, and I, uh, they were on my wall for years. And I, that, was kind of, that was one of the first things I got, that in a, in a canteen. And I've still got, uh, still got all those. And um, I thought that was pretty neat at the time, that I got to pick it out, take it home, and it was something made in Oklahoma. My dinnerware is Frank Home, and it has been since 1975. Now I've changed some patterns over the years and some colors over the years, but I still have Frank Home, and I still use it every day. I have some favorite uh, art pieces that I have in my home that um, I'll probably never part with. In the early days, you just had to get out and, and drive around from antique shop to find stuff. Uh, and then once eBay came out, then uh, some pieces that we thought were extremely rare was, they're still hard to find, but not quite as rare as we had originally thought. Because they, they turn up, it, it's amazing where all this pottery has turned up 
it can turn up anywhere. And there's new collectors all the time. They see a piece and you'll hear the same story. You ask them, why do you collect Francoma? You know, it's just a pot. But this same story from collectors, be they new or have collected for years and years, will be the same. You know, I was at a garage sale and I saw this little pot over here and I looked at it and I, I just, I had to hold it. And I reached down, I put it in my hand, I held it, and it just kind of talked to me and said it wanted to go home with me. That was 200 pieces ago. Now closing in on nine decades of existence, the art of John Frank holds as much interest as it ever has. A big reason for that is the quality workmanship of his pieces, which have aged very well. Whether they were made by John Frank, his daughter Johnice, or his highly skilled staff, many of the pieces still demand top dollar on the open market. Perhaps because of the clay, or perhaps because of the time it was made, the Ada Born pieces remain among the most valuable and sought after. They're not quite as powerful in appearance because they are softer but just the fact they were the beginning is why they're so popular. If I was gonna start collecting, I would try to, to uh, pick as much Ada Clay pieces because that's, it's old. They quit making the Ada Clay in 1954. I guess to the more seasoned collector, who knows you know, the, the years that the early things were made and the different early marks that's what makes it more collectible. Now, there are folks that just collect the sepulpa clay. Uh, there are folks that really like the first sepulpa clay pieces from the 50s, but a lot of the really hardcore collectors uh, identify with Ada as the oldest and, and think that it you know, looks the best. In the end, it's the people who made the Francoma pottery as much as the pottery itself. Generations of proud Oklahomans have dedicated their lives to maintaining the artistic vision of John Frank. They have lovingly protected and nurtured that vision, ensuring that it will never fade. It talks to you because it has personality. There's a lot of potteries in this world, but Frank Oma does have the personality of a warm man, a loving man, and shared his love of people and beauty with all that he touched. Frank Homa Pottery is to me an expression of art and an expression of your soul because part of you goes into those pieces when they are produced. Frank Homa was so prolific in what they made that we take it for granted because we see Frank Homa everywhere. But if you go back and look at those early art pieces from the 20s and the early 30s, they're incredible. And they're very high value. Um, and they will always be collectible. They're just, I, I believe there's, you know, they'll stand the test of time. <laughs>